Hi folks, Andy Rayner here from the UK. I'm Chief Technologist for Nevion in my day job. And I'm wanting to talk to you today about technology trends in live broadcast production. It's a bit of a long term, but you'll the, the vibe you'll get through um, as as we work as we work through the topic. I, I'm also renowned for enjoying a cup of tea, which will come up in context a little bit later on. Okay, so before we actually get into the um, the real nitty gritty of of the meat, what I wanted to say. I just want to do an unashamed plug for the VSF YouTube channel. We have a real um, unusually diverse content on the YouTube channel, considering um, we're a technology organization. We do how to make cups of tea and how to make cups of coffee. And if you're interested, um, you can see some of Brad's musicianship as well on that YouTube channel if you want to actually delve a little bit deeper. Anyway, enough of the plug of what's happening. Really want to just give you the, the outline of, of what I want to cover in the next 20 minutes, which is looking at how the broadcast industry in general um, is on this journey, um, inevitable journey, I think, from the bespoke to the generic. And there are several facets to that, which I'd like to cover, and we'll go into that in a minute. But the, the other thing I'd like to just plug, in case you may be thinking of dipping off and going somewhere else in the next couple of hours, is the, the panel session that we've got um, in an hour's time at 11.30 Eastern. Um, I'm chairing a session and we've got a, an unbelievable lineup of very um, learned people um, from the industry who are joining us. And specifically what we're gonna be looking, trying to look forward even further into the future to actually try and determine what the real broadcaster end game is, what people are really wanting to do um, in, in, the, uh, in, in, the final, uh, in the final capability. And sorry, there's someone just trying to ring me on my laptop and I have no idea why that happened. Hopefully that didn't come out. Okay, moving on. This is a picture I've used a few times and I call it the end game because it's such a generic slide. I think it's, it's, it's a useful thing to actually help us consider where we're moving. There are, there are a few fundamentals in the, broad, in the live broadcast production chain. One is live acquisition. Uh, that's always going to need to happen. So that's a real-time capture of, of, the, of the content that's happening um, at one, one end of the chain. And, and obviously at the far end of the chain is the real-time consumption of that content. Um, and then you've got various people involved in the production in the middle that are consuming it as they need to to do their job in the production. Um, apart from that, to my mind, we are here on a journey to what I call time aware media processing. So this is, you know, a more and more software based media processing chain and workflow um, that is that is inherently time aware. And we'll we'll come on to one or two elements of that a little bit later on. Just just a, a really, really, really simple slide to actually kind of observe what I see is the two biggest trends that you know, content producers are looking to do um, with technology. One is to up the production value. And there is some phenomenal, you know, amazing production values now in um, live, um, live content creation that's going on. Um, but also, obviously, there's a real desire to drive the cost down, not just for the new stuff, but to make what the, the status quo behavior would have been um, more cost effective and that that actually also becomes an enabler to make um, some content production viable that wasn't previously and I think we may talk about more about that later. As a really extreme example of that I don't know if you recall but this time last year at the virtual vidtrans that we had this time I did a five minute little mini um, series about my um, live church production. And I think it's an interesting case just to come back to literally for 20 seconds, because um, one year on, we've done over 100 broadcasts with, with no failures. And this is entirely a best effort solution, um, almost zero cost. I think the total investment we did for the whole infrastructure, obviously we had some infrastructure already, was about three and a half thousand dollars, something like that in total. And we're able to do what I think is an incredibly high quality live broadcast for, you know, 90 minutes every week um, using technology that's um, available, uh, you know, most of it free of charge. Um, and, and it works amazingly well with what I call best efforts technology in a, in a lot of the cases. So 
I just wanted to bear that in mind because I think, you know, it's an extreme example, but I think it's a useful reference point on what is achievable now. So let's just look at the journey we've been on, on one or two of these facets of what I call the bespoke to the generic. First of all, the actual connectivity. Um, I think the title I had originally put in for this talk was this slide, least lines to best efforts connectivity. And for those of you that are old enough to remember, I think when I was just starting work, we were on the phase of going from the coax and copper to the TDM digital. That was that was the, the just the juncture where I joined this industry. Um, a nice picture there to remind us of days gone past. So we moved from you know purely analog connectivity on 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 copper cables through to um, mapping effectively nom nominally PCM data and then various forms of compression into um, both PDH then SDH slash solid um, infrastructure. Then we moved over to what I call um, packet digital um, with quality of service. So that's ATM, which had an inherent quality of service in the way it worked. And then what I call traffic engineered or orchestrated IP, where we actually you know, are guaranteeing the performance of what we're actually doing. And then you know, what we've been looking and seeing a, a massive emergence of in recent studies is what I call packet digital without QoS. That's you know, basically leveraging typically relatively high bandwidth, but you know, non-QoS public internet connectivity um, to do this. So if we just strip down each of those and, and let, let's look at what the, what the implication was of using those. You know, back in the coax and copper, there was a cumulative degradation. So there were these hypothetical reference chains, I think we called them, uh, you know, basically you knew for every 100 meters of, of connectivity that you were doing, there was a certain analog degradation to the signal that you needed to try and make up as best you could. Then when we moved to TDM digital, we had incredibly low latency. The, the latency incurred there was very minimal. You, you, you had the risk of bit errors. Um, and you would typically maybe use FEC to do that, but the buffering was very minimal. When we moved from PDH to Sonnet SDH, we had to do some small buffering of a few bytes to allow for pointer justification. But in general, um, that was a, a, a still a very low latency element. Then we moved to what I call packet digital with QoS, so you know ATM and and then IP with orchestration and traffic engineering, and um, we've had to do more buffering then because. The, the, the loss characteristics are packet centric rather than bit centric. So um, you need to buffer more to be able to recover there. And we you know, have also tended to use F, a combination of FEC and what's known as 2022-7, now the RTP merge technology. And then we're starting to see the resurgence, not the resurgence, the ever increasing use of um, what I call packet digital without the QoS. And you know, to, to manage that in a, in a decent way, we're having to do much, much bigger buffers because there is quite a lot more packet loss than we, we've seen previously. So we can still use FEC and RTP merge and ARQ. And if you're, if you're not aware of the work going on in VSF with RIST, um, I'd like to point you to that because that's exactly the space that RIST has been, a, has been inhabiting in terms of making that last column there performance as optimal as possible for this broadcast live production environment. Now, you're very aware of the different technologies. You know, we've talked a, a little bit about the PDH and the SDH. You can see in green and blue there. And then this ever-increasing um, interface rates that are available on the Ethernet for, for carrying IP connectivity. So the bandwidth is ever-increasing, although still there are bandwidth-conscious decisions that need to be made uh, as we move along. Now we've talked. I've talked about kind of least line and best efforts. I think there are two. There are two ways that we're tending to see best efforts in use at the moment. One is what I call pre five G, or uh, as in four G LTE, uh, and some elements of initial five G, along with typical what I call you know, VDSL and fiber to the premises type deliveries that are not class of service and quality of service aware. So you're very much relying on the being sufficient slack in the system to allow you to get what you need through when you need it. One of the holy grails from a broadcaster's perspective on 5G, and I've been in the middle personally of doing some trials on that in the, in the, in, in the last um, few months. And if you wanna look it out, I'm doing a webinar about that this time next, next week. 
um, to talk about what we've seen there. But the, 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 the holy grail that's offered from 5G is there is a toolkit within that as yet, un, as yet unrealized by many um, mobile network operators that actually provides the, 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 some deterministic performance capability there. Okay, another, another transition from the bespoke to the generic we're seeing is the connectorization. It, it kind of sounds obvious, but when you think about it, this is actually a, a really big step change. So we've, we've, you know, we grew up with, or some of us that are old enough grew up with analog connectivity of video and audio, and then SDI connectivity and AES audio. We then, we then moved to IP interfacing, and the beauty of IP interfacing is subject to the bitrate available, it's obviously completely agnostic to um, the spatial resolution that you're using, the temporal resolution you're using, the bit depth, all of those elements um, is completely agnostic. Now, though, there have been some things we've been doing with IP to make them work in, in special ways, if you like, to actually make sure the performance is meets what we need. And, and some of that is probably being more relaxed as we go into the future. But that's another transition of bespoke to generic that's happening and effectively, largely speaking, has happened. Compression is another, is another toolkit which, which was really resisted very heavily. I remember a major Euro, um, UK broadcaster back um, some, maybe was it 30 years ago? I can't remember how long, maybe 25 years ago. Um, trying to make a decision between, um, you know, for SD video, beta cam and, uh, and and digi beta cam and D5, simply because um, in in SD domain, the the beta cam actually used a very a very minimal, I think four to one compression, and the D5 at SD rates was linear, and there was a real concern about the possible adoption of compression. Well, that's long gone, and you know, as we know. The compression the likes have used by DigiBetaCam and everything ever since has, has been highly effective. And one, one challenge we do have with compression, if we're not careful, is making sure that when we concatenate compression, we don't get degradation. And that's something that you know was a challenge in the past, but um, you know, in, in analog world, but as we move to potentially adopting compression at different points in the chain. Then we need to be make sure that we're we're savvy to that potential um, that potential risk. So, the earliest form of compression was obviously interlace that gave us roughly a two to one compression, and, and again that was driven by the technology capabilities um, of the time. Why did we want to compress video? Well, sometimes it's storage cost, sometimes it's interface cost. As in, you know, for instance, if you want to do UHD. And, and you want to stick to relatively relatively inexpensive 10 gig Ethernet interfaces, then you may want to adopt um, compression to keep your UHD feeds within that. And that's interestingly a, a slight trend we're starting to see. And I think we may have a bit of discussion on that in the panel later as well. And then also bandwidth savings. Again, bandwidth, as we've seen, the, the available bandwidth is ramping up you know, continually in terms of availability and ramping down in cost, but certainly when you're wanting to travel and transit specifically internationally, that's when some of these elements come into play. And there are, you know, various compression tools that we've we've loved uh, over the years. But I think, you know, over the last ten years, a JPEG 2000 has been a what I call the dominant mezzanine compression. It's been um, nicely generic, thanks to um, the VSF TR01. We've had very good interoperability between the industry players. Um, and hopefully that same is going to be true of JPEG XS moving forward. We've just been starting to do some of that. And you can hear from John D about that a little bit later on. There is the famous compression triangle. And uh, the reason I wanted to raise this is because in a minute we're going to be talking a little bit about latency and delay. Um, and th this triangle is, is, you know, has been that famous one of the compromise you make between the quality you want to achieve, the bandwidth you're prepared to consume in your network and the latency that you incur to do a decent job of making the compression. Um, our friends in Interpix, who, who were behind a lot of the work on um, JPEG XS, um, they, they produced this slightly more complex triangle. It's no longer a triangle, it's a pentagon. Um, um, just to show you some of the elements of, of different types of compression and how they come together. And you can see there very specifically, I think what interests me is the 
is the JPEG 2000 to JPEG XS transition, um, where JPEG XS gives us even lower latency, although the, the JPEG 2000 ULL that we, um, I think, ratified in 2018 in VSF um, is, is incredibly low latency. This is even better and, and also has lower complexity. But if we think just dwelling on that latency element specifically, um, one thing I want to observe on, and I think this is a this is one of the mindsets that I see changing in the industry that's driving the acceptance of some you know newer and emerging technologies is learning to work with some degree of latency. So you know the you know, the creatives I think in general in my experience in, in in the content production kind of you know have wanted you know zero latency on everything because that's the way you that's that feels the best and obviously that's the case but it's interesting to see and you know some some colleagues of mine that have been involved in in deploying in in sports networks augmented reality um sets for um production etc as soon as the creatives see an opportunity for something that uplifts going back to that original slide of mine the production value the production value can increase significantly they're prepared to tolerate things like latency for the sake of having that capability. And, you know, I've seen similar, um, if you like, behaviors or thinking when we've actually had some other trade-offs with latency on, on other areas, not, other, not only AR um, in there. So there, there are, you know, a couple of things to do with latency, I think are important, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But um, first of all, there is one non-negotiable latency, which is the you know, the 200 kilometers per milliseconds. So that's the, the transit delay in networking due to the speed of light in fiber. That is your non-negotiable. But to my mind, pretty well, all other incurred latencies, if the design is architected correctly, can be really, really minimized. So this is a, this is a picture that I've used a few times to look at um, the different elements that we're looking at in what I think is probably an emerging distributed model, distributed production model, where we've actually got on the acquisition site or the event location on the left hand bottom left there, we've got some processing there, we've got some storage there, we've obviously got all the acquisition going on. We're moving probably to having the actual, the number crunching, the actual production stuff happening in either private cloud or public cloud infrastructure, typically in another location. We've potentially got you know, 5G contribution coming in or, or some other wireless type contribution coming in. We've got at home control, you know, remote surfacing to home, which has been something that's really come to life in COVID, as well as stuff happening in the, in the central facility. Now, all of these incur latency, but as I say, I think the only one that we really, really cannot engineer out is just the transit delay due to the physical distances involved. And even some of those we can actually compensate for in the way that the production works. And I don't think we've got time for that in this, but we'll talk about that later. I know I mentioned it a couple of times in the last three or four years, but I've just come back to it when we're thinking about latency. This was the um, John Logie Baird system that was being trialed in 1936 by the BBC. Um, and it, it was actually a live telecine that was then developed and, te and, tele um, and telecine scanned and scanned, flying dot scanned on the fly. Um, so it had a latency of something like 47 seconds from acquisition through to it actually coming through. So if we think we've got problems with some of our you know, more software based infrastructure moving forward, just, just remember back to some of those systems they were trying to work with you know, approaching a minute of latency in their production chain. In terms of latency optimization, I throw the gauntlet down to one or two of the colleagues that may be on the on the call here. For a start, in Simpty 2110, we, we, we have a nervousness about something called TR offset, which is, you know, everyone wanting to, quant, you know, to actually present time exactly at the start of frame. And we had some discussions in some of the standards work in the last couple of weeks on this, why there is a nervousness to use a TR offset, because I use as an example, a vision switcher. A typical vision switcher um, may have one or two lines of delay when used in SDI mode. That same vision switcher, if people are adverse to using TR offset in uh, an IP manner, 
actually will incur a whole frame of delay because the only way, even if you've only incurred one line of latency as part of your processing, if you're not going to use a TR offset function, you actually have to then delay to the start of the next frame to actually have a zero offset. So what may have lost, what may have cost us one line previously may cost us a lot more like a whole frame if we don't embrace some of the tools to manage latency. I've got a cloud picture there as well, because again, the way we hand data off in cloud is also um, subject to latency, which we'll come on to just in a second. I'm not going to dwell on this. I just wanted to point it to you because I think it's a very valuable piece of work that was published last week, last week, last year even, by the DPP um, on the different models um, of doing production. And the reason I think it's interesting is all of these different models are you know, starting to be embraced as business as usual now, but what they all involve is more connectivity because it's all about having the different things in, in the different different things physically in different places. Um, I think that's a very important um, concept to get around in the way we are starting to do pretty well all production moving forwards. Just looking at compute, um, you've seen many graphs like this. I think one of the interesting things about this, this, this graph, which I, which I found, which, which sp scan, spans 120 years here, but I think they, the last six plots on here are actually G courtesy of GPU acceleration rather than CPU acceleration because they're very good at doing specific roles. But looking at why compute is more acceptable, because if I think back 20 years ago when we were starting to do stuff, more stuff on compute, there was lots of concern about OS. There was lots of concern about really highly optimized real-time operating systems. But what we've really seen now is, is, is standard Linux and, and standard networking stacks become much, much better at doing stuff. The timing resolution of, of the OS is, is, is working better. And also compute is having to cope with handling media for the mass market as well. So again, what was bespoke is becoming more generic for us to adopt and use within the broadcast industry. So I think all of these are reasons why we're adopting more and more um, standard compute and are able to adopt more and more standard compute as we move forward for, for broadcast applications. There are still some challenges, especially if we go from private, private cloud to public cloud. There's, you know, I would still challenge the cloud providers and I, uh, there's going to be one on the panel later on to on the on the virtual network perfor networking performance on in cloud routing um, specifics on IO for and, and NIC performance and also again touched on it previously latency optimization for handing data between software processes is something that we need to really focus on and I know there's some work going on in VSF to look at that also challenges on redundancy architectures not going to talk about that now because the, the time is getting near to the end. Um, also, other emerging tools. There are, there are several other tools that uh, have you know, become available in the marketplace that are actually very attractive because of the plug and play nature that they have and the way they can interface and get things up and running. There are some challenges with some elements of these, but they are in their own space. They actually work very well. So in going from the bespoke to the generic, one of the key things for me is we're making um, what was previously unviable viable. So there's lots of multi-camera production that can be for relatively low end sports and things like that that's now being done because of the cost efficacy of doing um, um, distributed production with the kind of connectivities we've been talking about. And going back to this, this diagram, all of these elements you know, are coming into play. And if we optimize each of them, um, then there is, there is a real potential for, for future cost-effective and, and high-performance um, live production. I think we've probably gone through this. I just encourage you to read a couple of the, you've, this was the document I referred to previously, the DPP um, paper on live production from last year, and also some of the IABM studies um, on content creation. Before I end, just want to say one, one thing I'm really proud of is that VSF 
is has been there all the way as we've evolved there and the work we're doing on grad to clowns at the moment and risk to cover best efforts connectivity are you know are, are on two key areas that are really emerging as the way forward as we move from this generic broadcast infrastructure to a bespoke infrastructure okay very finally as i come to a close um, I, I keep offering these um, invitations for cups of tea. Um, my friend Lee Widdecombe from Canada actually rang me about three months ago and said, I'm actually not that far away from you. Can I come over for a cup of tea? So he did. So that's him in my kitchen and outside my house. And I like to extend that offer to everyone else. Um, if you don't manage to make it over to the UK, I hope to see you at, the, at VidTrans live in person in June and talk to you there. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Brad. Ah, great. Thank you for a great presentation, Andy. I did just want to point out that this uh, trend that you've identified is also applicable in the software domain as well, and that yep. people have been moving from very vertically integrated media-specific application design styles to adopting a number of IT best practices as well. And um, so that's a, that trend has, has gone along with the trends in timing and thinking about an accepting delay um, that you highlighted in your presentation. Um, and the VSF have been working there uh, quite actively as well, adopting some of the AMWA and MOS specifications with relation to that. But also you see vendors more generally adopting a uh, less of a kind of very super tightly integrated, very brittle type uh, application stacks too. And that's all great. It's a natural evolution in, in what we're seeing. Thank you very much, Andy. Appreciate it.